I'm sure you've got a folder somewhere. <coughs> Paper straws. There's a rant I could have for a long time. Yeah. It is inherently wrong to have paper in your mouth. Having paper in your mouth is a directly uncomfortable feeling that should not be associated with food. Okay. I mean, I almost never use straws, so I have, I have no... I, this is one of those conversations... This is one of those nationwide conversations that I just don't really have a, uh, have a foot in. I don't, you know, I, don't, I don't drink with straws, so I what don't care. What are you, some adult that can drink from a cup? <laughs> I just never have a reason to use a straw for anything because, like, because most of the time you get straws is from if you go to like Starbucks or like McDonald's or something like that and get a drink from there. Neither of which are things I ever do. Yeah, you never really eat fast food that isn't take it isn't delivered to you, do you? <laughs> because that would involve going out into the world, and that's not okay. I mean, no. I mean, I wouldn't describe delivered food as fast food in any meaningful way. I guess, I guess Domino's really isn't it? Is the that was mostly yeah. what I was thinking. Yeah. I think Domino's and Subway are about the only two forms of fast food that I ever eat. But yeah, I haven't had a McDonald's or a KFC or a Burger King in years. So I'm now trying to define fast food. <laughs> because of course I am. It's like someone's making it for you, but you're not sitting down there. That to me is the distinction of fast food. Okay. I mean, okay. <laughs> Your lack of opinions is so disruptive at times. Well, I, mean, I, think I, I agree with that largely. I, I can't really think of anything that's obviously... I think fast food probably also contains like an, there's like a genre in terms of like what kind of food you get. Like I think, like if you went and got, and right, so in Coventry and I presume in other cities around the place, there are, there's like street food vendors that have for like falafel or like Chinese stuff. No, Coventry invented that and hasn't exported it. <laughs> I mean, I bring up Coventry because that's the only time I've ever experienced it. But yes, I presume it's in other cities, and I, I'm not sure I'd. Quite, I don't know why, but that wouldn't fall under fast food for me. Because it's a different... Because it's not a burger and chips, you know? It's sort of like... I struggle calling calling Subway fast food because it's not a burger and chips. I struggle calling it fast food because they're so damn slow. <laughs> no, fast food isn't about the food. It's about the fast. Okay. I would class... Right. I would class going to an Indian restaurant and getting a takeaway curry as fast food. You, if I sat down and ate it there, that's no longer fast food. That is then a restaurant. <laughs> but it takes forever for it to be... It's only like 15 minutes. Faster than I could do it. <laughs> I, love, I love how for you 15 minutes or half an hour, is that still fast food? I mean, KFC can be a good five. It's shocking. It's disgraceful. Going to the chippy can be a good five or ten minutes, depending on what you've ordered. Mm. And that's definitely fast food. Don't you dare try and claim it isn't. <laughs> Again, it just doesn't, it just doesn't, like, for me, fast food is like a, is, is a genre of food rather than a measure of how quickly it's delivered to you. A genre of food? Yeah, I can't think of a better word. I'm sure there is a better word to describe what I mean, but I can't think of it. But surely, internationally, that means the definition would change, and that's not okay. Everything must conform to my Western standards. <laughs> <laughs> Episode 61, Ryan is no longer here because he's been crucified by the internet. <laughs> I just sacrificed all my woke points for the day. <laughs> what is this? What is this anymore? This is setting the tone for the entire episode. That's what this is. This is kind of the we've given up special for the closed season. Yeah. This is where it all changes. Yeah. Off season's rough. Well, we've done we've done literally 10 times more episodes than I thought we would at this point. Was that genuinely your expectation? Was I, that based on your own sort of ability to stick it out or I my ability to stick it out? <laughs> I genuinely thought we'd do about six because I think a lot of a lot of these kinds of... I've read somewhere that like for most sort of episodic type things, seven is kind of the most common point to stop doing it. I don't know why that would be, but that's sort of like... I think there, but there's a combination of things. So it's sort of like we, we planned the first set of episodes based around a season of robot wars which is six episodes so it's like well we have six episodes worth of content so that was that there's also the combination that like i'm i'm definitely the kind of person that like picks up a hobby does it for a little bit and then drops it whereas this has been something that i've you know sustained for a long time which is unusual so what you didn't account for was my ability to take a hobby and turn it into a complete personal identity <laughs> yeah it's good though. I'm glad we've done it. Is this like the episode sixty introspection, just because it's a round number? Well, just because it's, it's. I think it's because it happens to be a 
a nice multiple of how many I thought we'd do. <laughs> you know what I like as well? We started our BattleBots coverage for the season on 50. Yeah. I don't know why that impresses me, but apparently it does. Well. But now we kind of got the long wait for BoggleBots. And thankfully, before BattleBots happened, we kind of created something that is the perfect filler material. <laughs> so what we're going to do is not that. <laughs> Because, frankly, I couldn't be bothered with the admin this week. <laughs> <laughs> and that's fine. Retunctie will get finished. That's, that's something approaching, but not technically meeting the definition of a promise. That's a, that's a spinner-proof promise. <laughs> <laughs> that's the spinner-proof promise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is kind of post-season miscellany, I suppose. We should start, as always, with follow-up. Is this follow-up or is this front matter? I'm well, you've, pedantic. you've put it in the follow-up section. Yeah, because I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> well, it's because we so we've discussed bingo in previous episodes, so it counts as follow-up. This is self-indulgent follow-up. That's what this yeah, is. It's fine. This isn't people have told us things. This is just we want to talk about the things we've done. Yeah. That's what we're doing yeah, here. Look at us. Aren't we great? Bingo is over, but also not over. <laughs> the classic case of the final episode not being the final episode <laughs> we did say when we did it that it would probably run into 2020 and it seems like that is going to have to be the case because we do have a couple of things that still could potentially get ticked and considering we're in a tied situation i think we've got to roll with that the main one is elephantastic we know that nelly has another fight coming up we know it's against shellshock we're expecting that sometime soon-ish for supporters, and then at some point that will go online properly publicly. So I guess we've got to wait until it's online properly publicly before we can tick or not tick that square. Well, we've got to wait for it to be online publicly before we can tick or not tick that square publicly. Like we could, we could, <laughs> we can do it whenever we want. <laughs> I've actually already ticked or not ticked it. <laughs> we know. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know. The other one, which we, we could discuss now and make a decision on, but I feel like we have to involve everyone, because it has wares. Reddit comment came in, I'm not prepared, so I haven't got the username, I'm sorry, suggesting that Monsoon using a piece of bombshell should count. Now, I, I think this is spurious because it was a piece of bodywork, which I would personally argue is not a robot part. It is a <laughs> robot material. <laughs> But that's a conversation we can have with the guys and make a decision. <laughs> I think that's the most petty definition I've ever heard you make. <laughs> Why, thank you. Unbelievable. Well, that'll be a fun conversation to have <laughs> as, as, as three other people <laughs> disagree with you. I mean, I'm the one that makes the graphics, so what are you going to do? That's true. I shall, I shall clumsily edit your graphic. I think you could probably do a good enough job of editing the graphic, to be fair. The other thing from Bingo I just want to point out is something that wasn't in the episode and was in the show notes. And I know people don't necessarily read the show notes because they're terrible human beings who don't know how to podcast properly. That's so mean. Get, get your act together. <laughs> I ran through the stats of whose predictions got ticked off and whose didn't. That's a terrible way of explaining it. I counted how many predictions each of us had ticked off of the ones that we had given. Mm -hmm. Not the ones we received. So the story all through was, oh, Mike and Sam were so mean with their predictions. They're so hard to get. Spinnerproof gave really easy ones. The exact opposite is true. <laughs> of the predictions that Mike gave for roasting robots, nine of the 16 came true. Of the 16 that Robocast made, eight came true. And of our 16, only five came true. Ooh. But we did give three of those to ourselves. <laughs> well. What I also love, in fact, that that is a real outlier because everybody else gave more away. Wait, that's, that's not that surprising. I know how numbers work. It's all in the show notes. You can read it for yourselves. I'm not an explainy person tonight, apparently. But Brilliant. yeah. We gave shoddy predictions. We are not psychic. So that, for me, is the end of Bingo Update for now. At some point in the distant future, there may be more. There may be Bogglebots Bingo. There may be Battlebots Bingo for Season 5. I think this is now a bingo podcast. <laughs> I know, it's just like, got to go update all the websites. No, no longer a, a 
podcast about combat combat robotics. It's a podcast about bingo. Bingo about combat robotics. We'll <laughs> no, give just, it that. Just bingo. <laughs> and nothing else. How would you make a normal game of bingo work as a podcast? I mean, I don't know. I mean, I guess it would be a more interactive podcast than usual. Because I guess you could make it work in terms of, you know, in the show notes, there is a bingo card. <laughs> No, you'd have to have a website that can generate a bunch of bingo cards where every listener gets a different bingo card and then they can all play. I'm sure there are but ways. But how to are you meant work. to have a winner? Is it like I got bingo in this many numbers? Because there's no real time element to it. I don't know. You could, you, well, you could give the timestamp for the timestamp within the episode when you got bingo. How do we trust people? <laughs> <laughs> That's very philosophical. <laughs> I can almost imagine, like, a Twitch bingo live stream being a thing that might already exist. I'm sure it does. I'm sure. I mean, old people do use Twitch, so. <laughs> I was going to say, that was the point Mike made that basically no one under the age of 60 does play bingo. So th this might not be the best targeted idea. <laughs> this is how we get old people to be tech savvy. <laughs> Just introduce. Well, no, because I feel like introducing technology to bingo is not going to be met with a round of applause. No, 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 no. You outlaw all forms of bingo that aren't online, forcing them into the digital oh, age. Yeah, of course. Of course, forcing people to do something has is, is historically always worked really well. The best way to make the world better is through stringent legislation. And that wasn't meant to be a political joke, but it might be one. <laughs> we should move on. Shall we pivot away from this? <laughs> we should move on. Um, we went to a Beetleweight tournament a couple of weeks ago. Indeed we did. The FRA Beetleweight Championships that may or may not be called Euros. Yeah. I still don't know when I was there. <laughs> we'll never know. Um, so yeah, we, we went, we took hello there, and as promised, I did film things. And uh, and we've now released videos. We've released videos of all the fights we had in full, as well as a much longer than we anticipated um, recap video about everything that happened and and the story of the day, if you will. It's all about the story. Yeah. So links to all that will be in the show notes. You should go and watch. Also, we have a YouTube channel now. So do you have to like, what, like, subscribe and hit some bells? Is that what YouTubers say? Oh, you got to smash things I'll as smash well. The, oh, I'm sorry. Smash the bell or, or something like that. I don't know. I don't care what you do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm technically meant to be managing the YouTube channel in the same way I'm technically meant to be managing Twitter. <laughs> I said, I honestly can't tell when people have replied to things on Twitter. Well, I'll try and tell you when people reply then. <laughs> <laughs> like a game of telephone <laughs> someone tweets us i'll see it but not reply and tell you <laughs> no no what you need to do is print it out for me oh brilliant yeah and i'll reply course. on there and then you can put that online <sighs> let's not do that <laughs> have a filing cabinet of all our tweets and responses <laughs> it's backup backup's important that would be a backup i don't have a backup of our twitter i mean nothing of value will be lost if that goes down <laughs> I have a despite so like you're right there is nothing of value there and there's nothing there was also nothing of value on like my personal Twitter account but before I went on a purge and just deleted every single tweet from before like six months ago and I have a bot that regularly does that now but before I did it I thought there might, like I just felt terrible deleting all that data so I have I have got an archive of all my of all my old like angsty teen tweets for no reason that I will never look at and don't really want anyone else to look at but for some reason I felt the uh felt obligated to to download and preserve it so now it's on my like home server thing and is backed up a thousand times <laughs> it's just like oh brilliant release the archive Sam no release the archive no, no. what was it I used to always try and make you release Oh, episode zero. Episode zero. That's not happening. I'm not sure I have a copy of anymore. <laughs> Guess who does? And the problem is, I would now like one purely out of curiosity, but I know you won't give it to me for fear of me releasing it. Yeah, that's it now. I I am the controller of Spinner Proof. <laughs> you genuinely are. I wouldn't... It's like... This is going to get really more, but if you, like, died, <laughs> I wouldn't... I don't know why I'd want to, thinking about it, but I wouldn't know how to put an episode of Spinner Proof out. I wouldn't be able to. No. With the new co-host, I'd very quickly and very easily find. Yeah, I don't know what to do about that. Is, that I mean, is, I wouldn't bloody worry about that it. That is something I have thought about. <laughs> <laughs> like, what would happen? How would how would we... Because how, how, it, it bothers me that you... Because I want to... Be, I, I feel like we're equal partners in Spinner Proof, or I'd like for that to be the case, but it does bother me that you can't release episodes. <laughs> I like that I can't release episodes because it means I will never have to release an episode. <laughs> you can always just fob it off on me. 
Oh, I'm worried, I'm worried we're about to like somehow was, conspire to have an argument about the podcast now. We should was, move on. That was, a, that, was a, that was a weird tangent that I didn't see coming. <laughs> I'm good at that. <laughs> <laughs> it's always nice to just bring your own mortality into a podcast. You know? Yeah, what would happen if one of us died? <laughs> Who knows? On that note, <laughs> now back to BattleBots, that thing we apparently talk about. Sometimes. This is... I'll freely admit this is going to be a weird, probably like 20 minutes, where because of the format that we chose to do this season, which, by the way, I was very happy with. I enjoyed doing things a different way. It did mean that we missed a few robots out, that we have things to say about. It just so happens that in their one appearance or across their multiple appearances, there were just other things we wanted to talk about more. So this is kind of our chance to go back and look at a few of those. What I think I am going to end up doing, however, is thinking more about the reasons why we didn't talk about them than anything else. So if it turns into that, I do apologise. But who did you want to look at? This is the wrong way to start this segment because I didn't I didn't come up with this idea. <laughs> I gave you a list and you ticked off the ones you had things to say about. <laughs> I ticked off the ones I could make myself talk about if you wanted to. <laughs> that's, what, that's what really happened here. <laughs> I was happy to just move on from battle bots. Um no, like so we I, I have I I have thought I mean we didn't talk about blood sport and I feel like this is where this is where what we're about to reveal is I don't know the names of any of the robots. Blood sport's the overhead bar spinner thing. It is indeed. Yeah, that took a bit from Gigabyte. Yeah. We spoke about Blood Sport in the context of its match with Lucky. Mm. And we spent the whole time talking about Lucky and their drive setup and kind of overlooked Blood Sport a bit. Yeah. So I think Bloodsport was quite good. Like they were like for because they're a first time competitor and stuff. Like they that was a good that was a good robot and they did well. I thought. Yeah, they've managed to make a run to the edge of the top sixteen. They had that play in that was grossly unfair on them, really, in terms of them as a quite high mounted horizontal going up against two compact verts. Mm. That really wasn't a nice situation for them. Yeah. But they definitely dished out some good destruction, and they managed to be a spinner that. It wasn't reliable in the sense of something like Tombstone. They had that tendency to kind of crap out halfway through fights and then get going again. But they still did manage to deliver repeated hits. Yeah. Which for a... I mean, I know they're not a completely new team. I know they've got people on there who are experienced. But that was a really good showing for them, I thought. Yeah, I was I was very impressed. Like when I think... In my head, I don't know how true this is, but in my head, when there's like, oh, here's a new team and they've got a spinner, I immediately just go, well, that's not going to work because I think spinners are quite hard <laughs> to do well. And if you haven't done it before, then it's not, it's probably not going to work. But like, yeah, they, 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 they surprised me at the very least. And, and yeah, they were enjoyable, enjoyable to watch their fights. I think in my mind, they do suffer just by being an overhead spinner. Because something that's really crystallized for me this season is that. Basically, all of the circular robots kind of blur into one for me. So you've got Battlesaw, you've got Shellshock, you've got Gigabyte, you've got Son of Waiachi, kind of. You've got Kronos. That triangular robot. <laughs> it, it, it approximates to a circle when it's spinning, which every, it should be all of the time. Every polygon <laughs> approximates to a circle when it's spinning. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but not like an asymmetric polygon. You know, that's got like a higher density, <laughs> at a different radius. You're going to tell me that like a single tooth, like asymmetric spinner is not approximating a circle. It's approximating two circles. Every, You're shaking your head at me like that helps a podcast. Every polygon <laughs> approximates a circle. You know what I mean? All the spinny things where the spinning is their whole outside do tend to kind of blow into one. I forgot Captain Shredderator as well. That was bad of me. <laughs> the most circular of them. I mean, before the teeth start falling off, yeah. <laughs> but breaking off, to be fair. Yeah, for me, there's always a danger that any robot like this will fall in with that. But they did at least kind of come in and go some way to fulfilling the niche left by Ice Wave, in that they are the only kind of pure overhead spinner. Mm. Son of Waiachi kind of has the cage thing going on. We've got lots of shell spinners. We've got ring spinners. They do have that little unique bit with that. And then they had to go out and use one of Gigabyte's spare poles that just made them look like them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good stuff. The next one we have chosen out of the ether. Another one that was on the edge of the top 16, and that's Scorpios. Yeah. Scorpios, for me, has suffered from being so similar to Sawblaze. 
Mm. I think every time I'm thinking of the overhead weapons, I group them together with saw blades. And then saw blades is the one that always stands out that tiny bit more. It's always gone a little stage further competitively. Its fights have always been that little bit more destructive if you ignore the Sidewinder one. Its colour is a little bit brighter. The driving is better in a slightly more visible and obvious way. And again, I think it's one we've overlooked for that reason, but they have had a really good season. Have they? I mean, I've almost completely forgotten them. <laughs> I suppose it doesn't help that their most destructive win was against a weird robot in Sidewinder. Mm. But they wrecked them. And they also had fights against some really tanky builds. So they had the fight against Tantrum, which they won easily, but couldn't do a huge amount of visible damage because Tantrum. They had Copperhead, where again, I wouldn't say they won that easily. They did take some big hits, but you know they got the opponent immobilized through a lot of sort of quite well-aimed blows as much as anything. Again, not much visible damage because Copperhead is incredibly thickly armoured on top, but they did a lot internally. They managed to bounce the thing over with a hit, which was quite impressive. They always showed that power they had, and they've always had the ability to take hits really well on the front, which has given us some quite spectacular stuff. You think of sort of the Lockjaw fight in the play-ins, for example, where they put on a really good show, if only by taking a pasting. Mm. which is something that we have to respect because that's basically our whole thing <laughs> yeah i find the change in team for scorpius kind of weird because i feel like this is pos- this is probably just because of the way it's all presented and stuff and they sort of like grossly overstate the uh the importance of like the team captains in things but like because the captain has changed hasn't it mm. and so i feel like it's not his robot which is probably not true and very unfair of me but i do find it odd that it feels like an entirely different team with the same robot, you know? It feels like they're competing with not their robot. Which, again, I'm sure that's grossly unfair. <laughs> but that's what it feels like, and I always found that a bit odd. I think that is a product, as you say, of the importance that BattleBots puts on people. And also this idea that there is no team, there is a captain. Yeah. So I would need to go and look this up properly to really be sure. I'm fairly sure that the people involved this year are pretty much the same as before, just minus one or two people. Yeah. So I think it is the same group who have all of that sort of ownership of the machine, but people that we haven't been able to see before. And and that, I suppose, is kind of a bugbear with the show as much as anything. Yeah, it's odd. I don't know what. Well, again, it's another area where I think they almost have that kind of competition with Sawblaze where... Jameson is one of the personalities that the show has really chosen to latch onto. Probably because of that one bit of trash talking in the overhaul fight and they suddenly went, film this guy more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Scorpios, again, one that I think was mildly overlooked by us. Although I think that's also partly out of my anger because they don't have a saw anymore. How dare they? At least the at least the root of their name is not saw though. True. So they've, I think they've got a bit more of a pass to use something that's not a saw as their overhead weapon. Is, mm, hmm. Oh, what have I done? Oh, no. I'm wondering, <laughs> is the name Scorpios there because the rear comes over as the weapon, like a scorpion's tail? Or was it also intended because score sounds a bit like saw? I think it is almost entirely. In fact, I'm going to go, no, no, I think it is entirely because of the weapon. <laughs> I mean, if it's because it sounds like Saw, then we've got to retract that free pass. No, no that, is, that is not why they've called it Scorpius. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would accept the idea that that's some like, astrology reason as more likely than <laughs> because it sounds like Saw. <laughs> maybe it is an astrology reason. I mean, maybe. Like I said, that's more likely to me than because it sounds like Saw. What is the uh, personality trait of someone who's a Scorpio? I'm sure you know this. Well, I feel like I should know it because I, I believe I am one, but I, I, I know nothing of astrology other than it's a load of rubbish. I mean, I don't know when your birthday is and I don't know what part of the year Scorpio is, so I can't help you there. No. Next up, another uh, sign of the Zodiac in Sidewinder. Sign of the Zodiac? What? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, people were thinking we're going like, to go on to Gemini, you know, put up the old curveball. <laughs> throw a Sidewinder at them. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> well, technically, you shouldn't throw a sidewinder at them. You should throw it kind of next to them. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Un- unintentional, involuntary laugh. <sighs> Love it. I'm so disappointed in both myself and you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Sidewinder is a weird robot. I don't know if we ever... Because this is... I don't know if we ever... I don't understand why they've put a spinner on the side of their robot. Because it's cool and weird. I mean, it is weird, but is it in any way effective? <laughs> they, they kind of fall in with what was quite a large group this season of slightly weird robots that no one's sure are going to be effective. But hey, we've got a big field, so why not include them? And they're the one that actually got a little bit of screen time. So we have stuff like Daisy Cutter, Battle Saw, Double Jeopardy... Electric Ray, which never even worked in the end. Kingpin. Lots of things that you looked at and went, that'll never work. And this was one that, in one fight at least, did work. Although, I, I don't know if it was actually released properly publicly or only to supporters, but they had a fight against P1, which they did manage to win, and win by doing real damage. And I think the whole kind of rationale behind the robot was, it's really hard to have a wedge and a horizontal. How can you have both? And that's pretty much what they did here. They had a wedge and a horizontal. <laughs> he just whacked a horizontal on the side. What I find funny is it seems to me like the bare minimum to make it similar to, but legally distinct from Tombstone, <laughs> which is, which is again, grossly unfair and an oversimplification of what they've done. But like, it is just funny to me. They're sort of like, how can we make a tomb clone that's not, doesn't look that much like Tombstone? Let's put the spiller on the side. <laughs> Next season, are we going to get one that's a horizontal spinner that just faces directly up above the robot, <laughs> still on the proper like tombstone-style frame? Oh, that would be funny. Ver- the vertical spinner tombstone. The bold new meta. <laughs> bold new meta, indeed. Oh, imagine how! Imagine the amazing gyro you'd get off of that. That'd be awesome. <laughs> be horrifying. It to- would end up wheeling to gyro instead of going onto a side. Oh, if you if you had it that way, I was yeah. yeah. For clarity, I, I did like hand gestures you mean, you in mean, the room. Yeah, you mean. I'm thinking to the left and right. <laughs> no, no, I'm thinking take Tombstone. Yeah. Take its body as it is right now. Cut the support off for the weapon where the box kind of ends, and just rotate it backwards ninety degrees so it's facing straight up, and then plunk it back down across the top of the robot. That's what I'm envisioning. Yeah. And that. Whether you like it or not, it's the perfect design. <laughs> a giant fan. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Call it a fan of Tombstone. Whoa! <laughs> Worth it. I was ready to go with the much more simplistic joke about how it should be the much dark... No. <laughs> <laughs> Forget about it. <laughs> how did we get here from Sidewinder? <laughs> C- cleverly. With great care and attention. Yeah, Sidewinder was one of those robots that managed to show that a silly idea can work, sort of. It's still not like at the huge level of seemingly silly idea works brilliantly. But it it got in there, it got a win. Gotta be happy with that. Yeah, I don't expect to see many Sidewinder clones, though. What if Ray comes back with a Sidewinder clone? That would be incredible. (laughs) Someone needs to optimise this terrible idea. Oh my goodness me, that would be funny. And as a final one for our little journey back through the Forgotten Robots... I don't know if this is a silly idea or not, but tantrum. I mean, I think it has to be a silly idea because it's an idea that I've had. <laughs> and I'm, gl- I'm glad that someone made it. <laughs> I have sent you some videos of them competing in China, haven't I? Yes. You have watched them, haven't you? Whether or not I've watched them at this point is irrelevant because I've forgotten it. <laughs> so the main reason I want to talk about tantrum is that obviously... We never really saw the weapon work at BattleBots, certainly not as intended, certainly not as we hoped. In King of Bots, it worked. I don't know what small changes they made to the geometry of the sort of wedges and forks and things that made that weapon engage. Maybe, as a lot of people will argue, it's partly a factor of having, at times, slightly weaker opposition. But that thing works. And it works well. And it was everything I wanted it to be in King of Bots. Excellent. That was really it on that one. I didn't have any more. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, 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 I'm glad that it works. So I think it's, I don't know. I think it's a, it's a, it's one of those sort of f- mechanisms that I think has got a certain amount of visual comedy to it that I really appreciate, and I'm glad that it's also effective. It's kind of got that boxing glove from a gun thing, hasn't it? Yeah. 
I because it's like I like that there's a lot more visible movement that comes from it achieves the effect of punching a robot and it achieves it and I I, I think that's really cool. Like one of the things I like about acts and stuff is that there is that they're much more visual. Like there's there's a big kind of you know the, the, there's the wind up and all that kind of stuff that you see before you get the hits and stuff. And I think I think that su- that um, tantrum even does achieves that with a different weapon type, which is cool. We've spoken quite a lot this season about the issue spinners might have demonstrating aggression in terms of with the judges. And I think this is the kind of system that overcomes that. But more importantly, a big hit just feels better to watch when you know there's that intent behind it. Mm. It isn't just the build-up that you get from something like a hammer. It's knowing that a person hit a thing that made that happen. Yeah. And that's what I like with this. It isn't, oh, we had our spinner going and got in a good position to hit you. It's, we wanted to hit you now. Yeah. Someone, I like to imagine, rather than just moving their thumb slightly, just like got a big lever and just pushed it down, (laughs) like when doing a building demolition. And that made it punch it. And the robot goes in the air and that person's really happy because they made that happen. That's how all robots should be controlled now. Their primary weapon should be on a TNT plunger. (laughs) That's good, but can we get all of their sort of mobility done on like a dance pad? (laughs) No, it's all plungers. (laughs) (laughs) Plungers all the way down. (laughs) Plungers everywhere. (laughs) That'd be a nice new meta for Battle Watts. What's the weirdest input method? You know, there's someone there like doing my idea of just shouting into a microphone to make the robot move. Someone else who for some reason is like playing Guitar Hero to control their robot. So many options. Ah, uh, yeah. Get it together, Battlebots. We've got to move into a new era. We've got to shake up the game. A new world. Perhaps even a new terrain. Well, I see where you're going. <laughs> I, I assumed you'd picked up on that sooner. <laughs> what kind of terrain are you thinking, Ryan? <laughs> Is it water? <laughs> Is water technically terrain? Oh. I'm doubting myself now. I feel like as far as most video games are concerned, it counts as a type of terrain. <laughs> I mean, in some, it's a whole biome. Yeah. You wanted to talk about the idea of battle boats because someone posted a meme and it made you laugh. That's what's happening here, right? No, I want to talk about battle boats because a friend of mine was talking to me about battle boats on the water and then I thought I'd talk to you about it as well. Oh, okay. <laughs> I saw no such memes. Well, this is a weird bit of timing then. <laughs> well, we've... I've... So you, you and I have discussed this kind of thing before of having combat boats... And then it happened at Robo Nerd this year. I didn't see any of it because I was looking at other things. We completely forgot to go and watch it. But like, I'm aware that it's the thing that happened. I have no idea how successful it was. Um, and then, yeah, and then a friend of mine was was talking to me about it as well. And I don't know, I just think it'd be an interesting thing to explore on the podcast. The first thing I want to work out here is what scale are you thinking? Are we going like heavyweight size here? Why not? Why not multiple weight classes? You know, why not? Why not? Why not just go go ham and have and have everything? But yeah, I don't know. I reckon you know, heavyweight that kind of, like that kind of size at least anyway in terms of like physical dimensions. Yeah, I don't know. Obviously, I've, the mechanics of how much you can you can float in terms of weight. I don't know. Well, but... I mean, you can float any amount with sufficient volume. Yes. Okay. <laughs> that's how that's how floating works. Yes, but like I don't know within like. I don't... If you imagine that the things are about the size of the average heavyweight, I you know, that's that's your volume limit for the purposes of whatever. I, like, four inch cube. Four, four inch, four inch cube. cube. I don't know, but yeah, you could do heavyweights. I reckon like things in the you know five kilo kind of kind of range would be interesting to do. That's the reason I ask because this is the kind of thing that people do already do in terms of more a naval reenactment. So people pulling together small remote control boats with projectile weapons. Mm. And obviously they're kind of limited to making a realistic boat. And that looks like it can be quite entertaining. I think it's it's definitely in the same place as UK Outweights for me, where it looks like it's a lot of fun to do, but not that good to watch. Yeah, and that is a valid reason to do something anyway. Oh, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> doesn't have to be something that works on television for someone to try and do it. But my immediate thought when we talk about this is, how do you make it look good? Because to me, projectile weapons ruin everything. 
which means that we're then expecting these things to have basically normal fighting robot style weapons but on water (laughs) which i think brings up a set of really interesting limitations because the idea of for example having a weapon that sticks out the front suddenly becomes a lot harder to make work because you can't have it interfering with the water line at all the battle for low ground in that respect no longer exists the other thing it completely obviates is um, vertical spinners, because you just sink yourself as soon as you hit your opponent. Yes, you would. <laughs> I so, hadn't thought of that. It completely solves that meta. <laughs> what if you just run the other way, though? So you hit them down and you go up. <laughs> I don't know. That would be interesting to try. I don't know what would happen in that case. An interesting one to try. I imagine what would happen, what would have to happen, is that what people build would look nothing like boats. Yeah. You're basically going to end up with... Well, first of all, are submarines allowed? Yes. That'd be really funny. Submarines and drones should be allowed. (laughs) Because obviously, having something like a submarine completely ruins the idea of having any spinning weaponry whatsoever. Or any... You know, something like a hammer as well is not going to work underwater. (laughs) A submarine, this is a weapon, is just a a stick that pokes up and it just goes under a robot and then just rises and (laughs) capsizes them. (laughs) That's pretty much what I'm thinking. They'd have to have something like that. I think you've got to allow projectile weapons. I think you've got to allow, if you're going to have submarines, at that point, you've got to allow torpedoes. (laughs) That just sounds less fun. Oh, it'd be so funny. I mean, I agree that it's less, it'd be less fun to watch, but I think it'd be funny. I love the fact that if you did something like this, the idea of grabbing and drilling actually becomes meta. <laughs> just from below, grab them and just start drilling holes in their hull. A submarine-style robot could potentially have that as it's one of its main strategies. I do also feel, by the way, this might be the kind of situation where you do end up with multiple weaponry being quite important. Mm-hmm. I don't think you could necessarily build something that just has one means of attack because you've got so many different ways to be attacked that you have to be able to counter. Yeah. So again, our idea of classical vertical spinner on the front of your boat does not make sense if you're being attacked by a submarine. No. There's underwater spinner. You'd have to have a lot of talk <laughs> to do it without propelling yourself anywhere. I mean, you could just attempt to make your, you know, whatever your means of movement is, if something like a propeller, make that really strong yeah. and attack with that. Just have an experienced propeller and try and hit, yeah, try and hit the subs. It's interesting because it's sort of like, I think submarines in some ways kind of ruin it because like they can't, I think they've got a lot of ways that they can attack. This is, gonna be, this is true of, I think, of, of actual warfare where submarines are quite good at attacking boats and boats are less good at attacking submarines. <laughs> We've got to ban submarines from warfare because it's not as much fun. Exactly. It's ruining the meta. <laughs> ruining the sport. <laughs> <laughs> what is the boat equivalent of a D2? <laughs> Just a heavily armoured dinghy. I don't know. Oh, you could do hovercrafts and they might actually be effective. Yes! Because <laughs> they'd be faster. <laughs> Presumably, I hope. They'd have no pushing power, but they Absolutely would be pretty quick. Absolutely no pushing power. They'd be able to turn faster as well. Yeah. Although, again, I'm thinking about this in terms of a traditional boat. I'm sure there are lots of ways of making what is essentially omni-drive when you're on water. <laughs> you just have propellers pointed in all directions. Pretty much, yeah. Because you could do the vector drive for that kind of thing, couldn't you? <laughs> Completely. You'd be less hydro- hydrodynamic in certain directions, most likely, but you could. Can you imagine a, a battle boat with a hydrofoil? <laughs> yes, I can. I can imagine that very keenly. Oh, that would be funny. Because that would get like, you know, the, um, almost like the, what am I thinking of? Megatento style kind of like enveloping opponents by just hydrofoiling up and then just stopping above them. (laughs) (laughs) I really don't know what the meta would become in this. I think if we say that submarines aren't a thing, because that does just make things too complex. And I think you have to have sinking as a means of victory, which doesn't exist for a... You can sink a submarine. Yeah, I suppose you can. Yes. <laughs> it's not like you put holes in them and they suddenly start floating. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's what happens to fish if you kill them. That's Submarines submarine. are just mechanical fish, right? Yeah. Submarine. Hitting an aeroplane <laughs> as it floats into space. <laughs> it's just a cheat code, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Oh, what was it? There was like a Chitty Chitty Bang Bang cheat code in like one of the GTA games. That was, that was a lot of fun. 
I digress. Well, as in just flying cars. Yeah, but they flew in a re- everyone. They flew in a really weird way. Like the way that they, fl- I mean, I'm sure this is in the same in other games, but like in the way that I remember from GTA was like you had no control over like their pitch or anything like that. It was just sort of like you accelerated and they would just sort of take off and just keep going up. And then as you decelerated, they'd sort of like level out and then start going down and stuff. They were really hard to fly. It was kind of flappy bird physics before flappy bird was a thing. Yeah. Accelerate for up, decelerate for down and try and steer. Yeah. <laughs> and just hope. <laughs> Cross your fingers. If you did have submarines, the control would be complex in that way, wouldn't it? Yeah. Well, it's in a similar way to, to drones and stuff because it goes from a 2D control thing to a 3D control. Which means that realistically, you're going to need a lot more brains in the robot to make that manageable. Yeah, because in fact, I guess with a submarine, as because it's not even just because that's just like three D in terms of just like lateral movement, but you've got to consider your pitch and roll as well, and you'd probably want mm. your you'd probably want a lot of brains similar to drones, a lot of brains in thing to deal with that because human I mean, humans obviously can consider all six axes at the same time, but like trying to control that would be a challenge, I think. I mean, roll can just be dealt with by weight distribution. You'd expect. Well, you'd need a way of correcting roll. Just make sure you're bottom heavy. <laughs> and you'll tend towards it. Yeah, you would tend towards it. I know, I feel like you'd probably want some kind of active kind of stabilisation for it, but yeah. Internal gyro. Oh, that's fun. I reckon I reckon you should have like multiple leagues, right? Ha, leagues like C. <laughs> <laughs> but like multiple leagues, because I, I wonder if it would be interesting to have like competitions that are just submarines and ones that are just boats. You know what you need to do? Make this a team competition. Make it like a game of battleships. You've got a big one and some smaller ones and a submarine all on a team. Specialisation can then actually be a thing. You haven't got to worry about the, oh, do I need multiple methods of attack to deal with different opponents? <laughs> it's like, no, we just make sure the team is balanced. This is like Pokemon on water and battle bots. <laughs> this is just miniaturised warfare. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And as usual, the nation with the most money will win. <laughs> <laughs> There'd still be a way to cheese it, though, wouldn't there? There's always a way to cheese it. Probably, yeah. How would you... I mean, like, if, I feel like, yeah. Build one that just, that just like, crawls along the bottom. Build a walker. <laughs> Does it get a weight bonus? <laughs> you know what? We no. mentioned it earlier. Would weight limits even need to be a thing? Or would it just be a size limit? Um, I don't know, because I, I, I guess the size limit does limit the weight. If you had a if you had a size limit that was like a cubic meter, your weight limit is the equivalent of a cubic meter of water, right? Like you've got mm. to be able to displace at least that much. So I guess I guess I guess it does sort of like inherently put. So I guess a size limit on its own sort of solves both problems. But then a size limit would would prevent people from coming up with ridiculous things like mammoth. Like can you imagine the equivalent of mammoth on the water? No, I can't to be honest. But like someone would try. I can't and, envision what that would be. Someone would try and do it, and I imagine someone would succeed given enough time. I mean, you could do a volume limit instead of a dimensional limit, which would then make something like a catamaran make sense super wide, basically jellyfish, but on the water. <laughs> <laughs> you had to bring it up, didn't you? I mean, I didn't. I genuinely wasn't planning to, but um, I just had that mental image, and it was jellyfish. Unbelievable. Well, actually, it was Huggy Bear first, but I didn't think you'd recognise that. Of course not. Exactly. Exactly. No, I think I think I think just a weight limit. I don't think you should put limits on the size of the thing. If people wanna if people wanna build a robot out of aerogel and make it the weight limit, then so be it. <laughs> this might well be an environment though where obviously in battle bots, realistically everyone is up at the weight limit. Because if you're not using all of that weight, you are kind of leaving a resource behind almost. Mm. This might be something where there are genuine advantages to being significantly smaller than your opponents. I reckon, so you mentioned about like teams and stuff. If you did like the weight for the entire team, so you can have some big chunky robots. And Multi-boats. Then you, and then you want, and then if you want your little, you know, then if you've got like a few hundred grams left over for your whole team, you you, you got like another little, get your little, little speedboat. <laughs> just does circles around the opponent just, and just, annoys them. Just running interference. <laughs> Yeah, this really could be something where you don't have to be big. Yeah. Tungsten boat. I mean, that would at best be a tungsten submarine, wouldn't it? <laughs> would you, so you're, you're not in favour of projectiles? No. What about, like, water cannons? I was thinking about this, whether you would open up any of the other current weapon restrictions. I don't think you would. Oh, you've got to allow flamethrowers. 
That's not a current weapon restriction. Oh, so I'm thinking of Robot Wars again. Yes. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't know why you're thinking of Robot Wars when we're talking about modern robot combat, Sam. I don't know. I'm sorry. As um, much as it hurts to say it. You've got to allow the flame. I think water cannons would be quite funny. Are they just the equivalent to a flamethrower in this environment? <laughs> uh, you could do like, because all you could do like, liquid flamethrowers and then just like leave a sheet of a sheet of fire on top of the water so many exciting opportunities that brings up the question of arena hazards but i want to answer all of this first so we're going to come back to that and you're going to have to remember (gasps) a whirlpool exactly (laughs) my thoughts exactly but the one thing i think you might start allowing that you don't currently is the use of magnets in weapons because i love the idea that something might genuinely be able to go up to an opponent and grip to do something like drilling or cutting. Purely because in water, you don't have the advantage of friction to sort of stop something being moved away by that kind of attack. I think that's the only thing I would allow that we currently don't. Why are magnets not allowed? Because I presume it's because they interfere with the electronics. Ah, that's a possibility, but that's also something that I believe you can shield against. If it were in the rules that you could do it, I believe people would be able to mitigate against that side of it. Hmm. I don't know if it's just viewed as a cheap tactic just, in the same way that entanglement is. I think you'd have to be like, yeah, I think you'd I think you'd have to write the rules very, very carefully to allow permanent magnets and electromagnets, but not allow but like have limits on how strong they are so that they're not effectively an EMP. You know, like you know, probably don't want an EMP as a weapon, although that would be quite funny. But like yeah, I feel like you probably have to be quite careful because, I don't know, Like, it just feels like one of those things that people would find weird uses for that are needlessly overpowered with like a ridiculously strong electromagnet. <laughs> I don't know if you could simply set limits on the pull force of magnets. Well, the other thing as well is like if you had like a permanent magnet as part of your weapon, you've got to, ha- you've got to f- make sure there's a way to let go. Oh, but as long as you're trying to let go. <laughs> <laughs> But no, that's also completely fair. Although I don't see why anyone would be using permanent magnets in this situation. It's not like they can use them for downforce on water. No, but you could like <laughs> just just like cover someone in magnets and sink them. I was going to say, would it be allowable? We've had robots in BattleBots that leave something on the floor. We had the, like the little magnetic road stop roadblock that I think was it was either Black Ice. Or po- Poison Arrow had some weird little deployable thing that wasn't really a mini bot as well. But yeah, it was Black Ice, I'm sure of it now. Yeah. That idea of drop something that gets in the way. Could you do a version of that that is just attaching something to your opponent to make them less hydrodynamic? <laughs> just put like put like a misplaced fin on their hull. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I just don't put know. a big sail on the side of them so they can't <laughs> drive straight. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure about that. Just thought. You can have house robots that are pirates. <laughs> Unrelated, but it's made me happy. Yeah. You can have an arena hazard that's just the Kraken. <laughs> just actual Kraken from BattleBots, why not? Here be dragons. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I, don't know about, I don't know about leaving stuff on opponents. I'm not sure how I feel about that. But I don't know if that's just because it's different and I'm not used to it, you know? To be fair, I think most of the things that are not allowed in robot combat are not allowed because at one point it was anything goes and people came up with ideas that people went, ah, this is making things worse, not better, let's ban them. I think you would have to go through that kind of process again with this. It is too far removed from what we currently do Yeah. to be able to say with confidence the things we currently allow and disallow will still make sense in this context. Yeah, I agree. I think you would need you would need to have the first few goes at this would be anything goes and then... And then they're slowly clamped down on the ridiculous ideas. Not the ridiculous ideas, but like the the ideas that aren't right. That's not right. It's not right. Like, so you probably, yeah. You, like, like deploying large electronic charges into the water. Probably not, probably not a weapon that you're going to allow. Slowly making the water more acidic. <laughs> slowly heating the water up. <laughs> Just try and boil your opponents out. Here's the new meta. Submarine full of compressed gas, goes underneath an opponent, oh, just release releases them. the gas, sinks them. I don't think that's how that works, though. I'm fairly sure that's how that works. Because you are reducing the density of the medium within which they are sitting. 
I, this is one of those things By where, it with bubbles. where so I think Mythbusters have done this. I, th- I, th- I think they have experimented with, can you sink a boat with lots of bubbles underneath it? I think they've tried it, and I think they couldn't do it. I thought they could. Ah. But if nothing else, the <laughs> choppiness created would cause problems. Yeah. Well, I know what I'm going to be rewatching soon. Um, but yeah. Yeah, at the very least, it would, it would be... Maybe that should be a hazard, though, of like an area that's just got like lots of bubbles and, and the whirlpool. <laughs> Basically a Bermuda Triangle. Yeah. <laughs> whirlpool is your kind of version of the pit. Yeah. That would be hard because, like, because what I have in my head is that very kind of picturesque, cartoony whirlpool that's very localized. But I don't know how. I suppose you just you would. It would need to be a whirlpool that drains, wouldn't it? That's the difference. It needs to have like it needs to have like a suction at the bottom to sort of drain and then pump it back in at the top to get like a tornado shaped whirlpool versus just having a big swirly thing. I think you can also get that by having something like a rotating set of blender blades, but I don't know if that only happens within a circular environment. This is another this is another Mythbusters thing where I think that Adam and Jamie came up with both these methods for trying to create whirlpools to demonstrate something and the suction one was more effective because you could get you could make a an effective whirlpool with suction with a lot less energy than with a blender blade type thing because what I think they found is that as you scaled up the size of the container, the one that was generated by spinning paddles at the bottom just grew to fill the container, and you were just trying to like move a ridiculous amount of water, whereas the suction one would always form that quite nice tornado-shaped kind of funnel. If you do the blender blade, it also becomes a hazard for the submarines. <laughs> That's true. To be fair, the idea of draining sounds quite good, because that means you can then have a place where it's being fed back in that is yeah. also a form of hazard. Two in one. It's a twofer. Just have a massive water cannon that refills things. <laughs> it's kind of like the equivalent of a pulverizer. Of course, you can generally recreate the BattleBots floor by having a few like sandbars, some shallow areas. <laughs> yeah, you could have because you'd have things that yeah sink things. Would you have like an? <laughs> would you maybe want an area that's 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 quite shallow, like almost like a like an under undersea wall type thing that you can float over if you haven't got a deep hull, but like submarines can't get to. Absolutely, yeah. I feel like you'd probably want rules about how long you can spend in that area, though. Well, I think as you have in, for example, BattleBots, I think there would be a clause in terms of you cannot avoid fighting your opponent. <laughs> yeah. But what if that wall were destructible? Yeah, ooh. How would you make it destructible? <laughs> I'm thinking kind of Series 1 gauntlet wall of bricks, but underwater. <laughs> Yeah. So something can smash through it, but it'll take them a little while and it might cause them some damage. Interesting, yeah. Yeah. I think what we've ascertained so far is this is a brilliant idea and someone should do it. Yeah. Netflix. Yeah, Netflix, Come get talk in touch. To us. Or Amazon. Or Apple these days. <laughs> I'd rather have Netflix, personally. Yeah, so well, people would watch it if it was on Netflix. <laughs> Harsh, but not unfair. <laughs> Apple TV plus i think it's called like that service is a ludicrously expensive and b has no content yet once battle boats comes everyone will yeah. be flocking to it <laughs> this isn't a question of choosing the best streaming service this is a question of making a streaming service great <laughs> this is a question of who will pay us the most this isn't the sort of thing you could do on a budget is it especially considering right. that in this context losing a fight would probably cost you most of your robot <laughs> it could potentially cost you all of your electronics every time you lost. I guess people, you'd end up becoming like a black box type thing, wouldn't you? I think most robots would have some kind of black box modular core thing mm. that they then can build out of. But yeah. It just seems like there isn't a way to lose in this that doesn't involve getting smashed. Mm. Although I suppose being flipped would be a thing. Yeah, have yeah flipped and sort of immobile. You'd have to mobility would be interesting. It's like got to see movement, but they're caught in the whirlpool. I guess they like <laughs> just adrift, <laughs> just 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 drifting around the <laughs> the perimeter of the arena. The whole arena could basically have a missing wall, basically just a waterfall on one side. So yeah, so the whole thing has got like a slight current to one side, yeah. and as soon as you're immobile, you just you, the inevitable happens. <laughs> Genius. People would love watching that as something just slowly drifts toward the edge. No, I think just... just nice just, pointy rocks at the bottom. Just have no walls and just have the every side like that. So it's like the weirdest sumo competition. Yeah. Or like, you know, an accurate model of the earth. <laughs> I hate myself for making that joke. This is terrible. 
<laughs> I've brought great shame to my family. <laughs> Your family all across the world. <laughs> I feel like we could go on this all day and I'm not sure I want us not to. What? <laughs> I can't pass that sentence. I've forgotten what I said. What I'm saying is, I think we could do this all day and I'm not sure that would be a bad thing. That's what I meant to say, whether it's what yeah, I said. Like, what you mean is we could do this all day and you think that would be a good thing. That's what you're meaning. No, right? I mean, I'm not sure it would be a bad thing. No, I don't know why you're putting so many negatives in this. <laughs> I'm not saying it is definitely a good thing. I'm saying it might be a good thing. <laughs> this is neutral or better. <laughs> <laughs> what drives a man into neutrality? <laughs> I'm kind of sad that we didn't go see it at uh, RoboNerd now. <laughs> I think what we're imagining and what happened at RoboNerd are quite a distance <laughs> apart. Probably, probably are, yeah. F- from what I've seen of the RoboNerd stuff, obviously <gasps> people weren't doing it they weren't putting a lot of energy into it a lot of stuff went in and didn't really work because it was an experimental thing that was for fun so you don't expect it to be the best showcase of what the idea can be scrap peep challenge meets battle boats i mean i'm already down for scrap peep challenge meets battle bots i'm just scrap peep challenge sold (laughs) it's funny quite a lot of what i've been saying through this i've been thinking of if you remember the show full metal challenge no it was Kathy Rogers who was in Scrap Peep Challenge. It was the kind of show she moved on to. It was kind of like the later weird series of Scrap Peep Challenge. It didn't happen in a Scrap Peep. <laughs> where they just gave people a budget and some time to build a thing. Yeah, kind of missing the point. Completely, yeah. Yeah. But I agree. Scrap Peep Challenge plus any form of robot combat equals good TV. Yeah, let's do it. And then that would be like nice. That, screw, screw heavyweight size. Let's have big full-size boats. That would be very expensive, but funny. You know the Bristol team do the bodge bots? Yeah. Which is basically, for people who don't know, I'm not just explaining this for you. It's, I just want to remind you that other people are listening. For people that don't know how to build robots. That's where it sounds like you're going with that. <laughs> people who don't know what they're doing, they go build bodge bots. <laughs> and now I've got to make sure it's very clear that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> now, the, the way that works is they recommend a set of very cheap parts that are the basis of something and then you just use household stuff to build the rest. It's kind of part robot combat, part Hebocon. It kind of sits in the middle and it's brilliant because of it. And I always love watching the videos of what people produce. I wonder if there's a way to do that in a kind of scrap heap challenge style. Like get people together. People pay an entry fee. This is basically an event idea. <laughs> people pay an entry fee. They turn up. You give them the base electronics and a pile of crap. <laughs> And a time limit. And it's like, right, got an hour. Everyone gets a hot glue gun. Go mad. It's <laughs> just a hot glue gun. Maybe some tape as well. No other tools. You know, here's all the electronics already put together. Stick them down, however. This is basically how I make ant weights. Yeah. Is it Stick a... stuff down. <laughs> Agreed. Is it a shared pile of crap? Of course it is. Yeah. And there is potentially physical competition to get to things. Yeah. Is it like a shared part of crap that you've like put like two really useful things in? Yeah, just hidden right at the bottom. Yes. Like when they're doing model rockets, it's like, oh, there just happens to be a rocket motor on the scrap heap. <laughs> oh, my favourite was when they were like building, building planes. Oh, there's a propeller here. <laughs> oh, God, look at that. Just <laughs> sat in the back of an old transit van perfect, where yeah. it belongs. It's a perfect, perfect wooden propeller. So silly. I wouldn't have minded if they just said we planted things. Yeah. Shockingly, Ryan wants the producers to be honest. <laughs> Who'd have seen that? How out coming? of character. <laughs> it's out of character because I've remained consistent on that viewpoint. Uh, that is out of character. Who are you? Yeah, that would be a fun event, I think. It's something that my school did once, my secondary school when I was a pupil, did that kind of thing for an evening, and it was really good. We were making contraptions to throw a ping pong ball at a target. Mm. I feel like this is treading dangerously close to like um, team building exercises. <laughs> And that's a bad thing? I don't know if you've been on a corporate retreat with team building exercises, but it's not fun. <laughs> I mean, I've done team building exercises. I've not done what I would call a corporate retreat. I'm not sure I've done Because that sounds like it involves staying somewhere sure with I've... colleagues. <laughs> I'm not sure I've quite done that either, but like, it doesn't sound fun to me. I don't know. Team building exercises are always... I find them hard because I'm not very good at working in a team. Um, but like, I don't know. The thing is with things like this, in team building exercises in particular, is, is there's like always one person, often me, that knows how to do it, and then no one else does. Or, there's one person that knows how to do it, basically you, and a bunch of other people who think they do. Mm. 
And you've got to show that you're a team player by listening to their wrong answers. The worst one that I remember is trying to do, like we had, like you had to work as a team to solve a Tower Hanoi. Now it won't surprise you to know that I, at least at one point in my life, knew the algorithm for solving Tower Hanoi. And this is when I was a child and knew it because that's the kind of child I was. You were a child and you knew you were a child. And, uh, and I knew how to solve this thing and no one would listen to me and it was deeply upsetting. Because it's like you sort of stack things in weird ways and yeah. I think the only reason that I get identified, this is going to sound like such a weird humble brag. <laughs> the only reason I tend to get identified in these environments as a natural leader is because I inherently don't trust the other people. <laughs> Your idea did not come from my head, therefore it is wrong. That's how the world works. Yeah. This podcast is like one of the only places I don't do that. And that's just because... <laughs> definitely do that no no no. you definitely dismiss the ideas that i have because they're not from your head what i was gonna say is i started off doing that <laughs> and you continually proved yourself to know more than i did <laughs> so now i don't think i do it anymore i don't know if you're saying that i do oh i'm sure it still happens from time to time only in areas where i actually am right <laughs> <laughs> if you say so i assume you're right about that are you <laughs> well naturally i said it yeah <laughs> so in conclusion battle boats good yep scrap heap challenge good yep ryan good up for debate <laughs> <laughs> no conclusion on that so far <laughs> the only issue with this conversation is that i'm now sad this isn't happening because it's not something that we can make happen no we've we've done our part now we've put this idea into the world we've We've, Completely brand new. No one has thought of it before. We, we've we, we, we've started another round of like suggestions and discussions about what the rules should be, and um, and now it's up to the uh, to the community at large to to make it happen exactly as we've envisioned it, <laughs> with no unique input of your own. If they do it again at Robo Nerd next year, morally we've got to give it a go. Yeah, we should probably make the effort this time or next time. To be honest, this time I looked at it and just went, I wouldn't know where to start. Yeah. Well, we just had, we had no time. We, we Actually, no... yeah, I was I was working. I had no time. I, I could barely put a foam board robot together. Neither, neither of us had time for anything. Hey, Sam, I have a gift for you. Would you like to know what the gift is? Uh, sure. It's an awkward transition. <laughs> I mean, it certainly is. <laughs> Into the much-discussed but never-undertaken versioning debate. This is something that you keep bringing up, and I'm... Like, not entirely sure what you're expecting this to be. <laughs> or is, uh, maybe I've forgotten. You know, you look very confused. Like, like so is this... Are you? Do you want to discuss when a, rush, when a robot has to change its name because it's changed too much? Or, like, whether or not you want to apply semantic versioning to robots? Or, or what? Or just all of the above? I want to discuss the detailed strategy you came up with a couple of months ago <laughs> for naming robots. So here's the issue that came up during Retunkti. We didn't know, or we couldn't quite decide when to class a robot as new or kind of iterated. Mm. So, for example, Pulsar competed in two series of Robot Wars, and then Magnetar competed. So we classed the two versions of Pulsar as one robot, and as soon as the name changed, even though it was essentially the same design visually, we went, okay, Magnetar, separate robot. And then this season in BattleBots, we have Cobalt, which is still carrying exactly the same name, but is a completely different design. <laughs> which, to my mind, means it should no longer be called Cobalt. Mm. It should be Cobalt 2 or Cobalt Redux or whatever weird way they want to put something on the end of Cobalt to make it a new thing. So I think Semver helps with the Pulsar side of things. I'm not sure it helps very much with the Cobalt side of things. But maybe it does. I don't know. The problem is, is that Cobalt and Cobalt are two are so different. Right. Let's wind back. Semver is semantic versioning, and it's a an approach to versioning software that a lot of products use. I don't think it's the best one. I think there are better ones for software. But like Semver is like when you see you know version one point two point three is semantic version. It means major minor patch, and then sometimes there's extra bit on the end as well. Um, and there will be a link in the show notes if you're interested to the full specification for what Semver is, because like like nerds like to do, there is a big web page with a full specification of what it is. <laughs> um, but like, 
I don't know. Like, I'm not sure that... Because Col Cobalt and Cobalt are so different that I'm not sure it makes sense to have Cobalt and Cobalt 2. But then I guess that does... I, I guess it is like... Because I guess in the world of software, that's like the difference between Photoshop and Chrome. Like, they're just, they're just not the same thing. Like, you can't have Chrome 2 that's suddenly like Photoshop. It doesn't make sense. Maybe the best way to approach this is we'll look at some case studies and yeah. think about how Semver would approach them. Okay. So, we've already mentioned it. Pulsar in Series 8 to Pulsar in Series 9. Visually almost identical, internally completely revamped. So Pulsar 1.0 is the first series of thing that we saw. And then you'd have Pulsar 1.1. So what would have to happen for it to be a Pulsar 2? So the thing about Semver <laughs> <laughs> is it's actually quite hard to bump the major version. <laughs> um, and it doesn't necessarily translate well. I think you'd, I, I would say that Magnetar would be Pulsar 2.0 because it's externally different as well as internally different. Like, I think you've, you've, you've sort of made backwards incompatible changes. So why does Cobalt to Cobalt not work as a 2.0? Well, it, is it the, because it fulfills a completely different function? That's the thing, I think, for me, is, 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 is that Pulsar and Magnetar are the same thing. Like, in, in the abstract, they're the same thing. You know, they're brushless, two-wheel drive, I was going to say drum spinner, vertical spinning implement type thing. You know, and, and, and they've got, like, stylistic kind of commonality as well, whereas Cobalt and Cobalt are don't don't share that and it's and it, saying cobalt 2.0 would make sense because it is a whole new version of the thing but like yeah it's weird so what about saber tooth in series 9 to saber tooth in series 10 still a drum spinner but internally and externally different and both crucially still yellow yeah i think you can i feel like I feel like it's very easy to fall into the trap of external changes equals major version bump, and I'm not sure it does. What did we, I feel like when we did this, when we, the last time we discussed this off the air, I feel like the thing that I came up with was, was the idea that different weight classes is what revved the major version. So because we have this discussion in the context of um, beetle weight split decision. And of what, course, yeah. And what version that would be. And, and we've had other versions since. And I think what we'd, I think the, the, the conclusion that we ended up with is you'd end up having like... Split decision version one, which is what people have seen. Split decision version two. And then before that, people would probably see version three, I think. You've, you've lost me. And maybe, I was part of that conversation. But, but, but yeah, I don't know. I can't remember. Anyway, but like, so I wonder if, I wonder if, I wonder if maybe Cobalt to Cobalt is not a major version bump. I wonder if that's a 1.0 to 1.1. And then if you did, because like, so for example, like Huge would be a good example of this actually, where you've got Huge and Huge in different weight classes, and one of them would be Huge 1, and the other one would be Huge 2. And the annoying thing is that that numbering would still be chronological rather than ordered by weight class. Yeah. So if they went, say, Feather to Heavy to Beetle to Ant, which I know is not the journey they've been on, but let's say it is, it would be chronologically numbered. Yeah. That would be awful. Yeah. So that is huge, not allowed. Huge 4 would be an Ant weight. <laughs> So what? Just to be clear, what are you saying for the saber tooth example? So saber tooth is the same weight class, so I think it would have to be one point zero to one point one. Even though, as far as I'm aware, there are no, not even any major components in common. It's basically entirely new build. But it's entirely compatible with the competition that it was in. So it's not made like a. It's not made one of those fundamentally breaking changes that means it can't compete in the same tournaments. That's the thing. That's the thing I'm going with. If it makes a change that means it can't compete in a tournament that it's previously competed in, you have to rev the major version. Which means which means if you have a robot that fought in Robot Wars and then you add a flamethrower, you have to rev for the, in the major version. I was going to say, what if the rules of the competition change? What if we're talking Storm 2 in Series 6 Ooh. where you, there was no active weapon rule to Storm 2 had it tried to enter Series 7 without an active weapon? Ooh. I don't know. That is interesting because the environment's changed. Nothing is static. Maybe I'll stick with my weight class definition. Maybe that's better. Is that because you think it's true or because you think it's easier? <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> the final big example I was going to go with, which maybe isn't as probing now you've decided that, but lift a bike force to spin a bike force is one that I find very interesting because so much of it is the same. The body is basically the same, but it's changed weapon. It's also changed its method of mobility. Yeah, I think that would be like a, a 1.0 to a 1.1. But then what's funny is that like, so 1.1, 1 
with the because then you've got then, then you've got the, the patch version as well so for every little tweak they make you've got like a patch version as well because <laughs> like one point so 1.0 had what the lifter is that what or whatever it was and lifter then, slash grabber setup lifter, yeah. lifter grabber thingy and then version 1.1 had the spinner and then whatever they entered the next time i think would be 1.1.1 <laughs> and then 1.1.2 and then i don't know how i don't know how often you have to rev those things i think what i feel like is every time you have a public appearance that's got something changed about it you have to rev the patch version does that change have to be noticeable to the i suppose not user in this case but audience no i think if it's just changed I will, I will, like, for things like batteries, replacing a battery does not have to, you do not have to rev the version for that. <laughs> Although what that if? would be funny. <laughs> oh, you changed an electron. I feel like that <laughs> probably, you know, you could draw the line somewhere. What if you go into a fight with your battery only half charged? I don't, I don't it's know. It's technically different. No, like, no, the battery, like, I think we can, we can ignore consumables like the battery, I think. Like, refilling a CO2 canister doesn't mean you have to rev the version. What if you've taken damage that you don't repair? Say someone with an axe has gone through your top plate and you no, don't that, patch it. That wouldn't that wouldn't change. If, if, if you did patch it, that would rev the version, almost definitionally. But if you didn't, then then you've got a bug. No. But then then like it's still the same thing. It's <laughs> a <Some> bug fix. <laughs> but like the whole thing breaks down though because because it does it just doesn't make sense to apply software version to oh, robots. Yeah. This is a terrible idea. And <laughs> I suppose the question now is, where do you draw a line on calling a robot the same robot? So cobalt to cobalt, to me, no. Yeah, that's crossed the line. The only thing it has in common with the original is the team. If they called it cobalt 2, I'd be fine with that. I don't think it needs a whole mm. new name. I think that I would, names I'd... can follow teams. I think that a name ends up being, for me, and maybe it's quite tied to the fundamentals or nature of the robot. If you are the Behemoth team, who go by the name Team Make Robotics or whatever it is, I don't think you can build a whole new machine and still call it Behemoth. No. If you are Team Carbide and you make a new robot that is different, I think you're still entitled to call it Carbide because that is your team name. Mm, no. That's a stupid. That's, what, what's happened there is that you've made the mistake of calling a robot the same as your team name. That's a it's the eponymous first album. That's a that's, 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 that's a branding problem, <laughs> and it does not entitle you to to reusing names. I think a name is like tied to a robot, like the, an idea of a robot. Like I reckon we so we could call our next robot "Hello There" because it's fundamentally the same thing, like four wheel drive axe thing. We're choosing not to, but like we could. I, that'd be fine, but like we couldn't. We couldn't call the the next one split decision because it wouldn't be a thwack bot. I think I think you know it needs to be it needs to be there needs to be like a for me there needs like if you're gonna have the same name if you line all the robots with that name up there needs to be an obvious they need they need to look like a set. I don't think you can apply our model of incremental versioning to most names. Well, the way the way that we've incremented the yeah. version, no, I don't think you that can. isn't going to work for most robots. <laughs> I think that works for some things, but not all of them. Yes, no one no one did figure out what or no one told us anyway why. Why, yeah. why, the, why the, so the, well, the current robot is hello there. The next one is going to be called Your Move. And uh, we... and that was an intentional, but incredibly difficult to use clue. <laughs> so, yeah. I can't remember the bigger point I was meant to be making now. I just wanted to say that. <laughs> <laughs> to make jokes about incrementing things, yeah. So, cobalt to cobalt, for us, not okay. No, not allowed. Big. Uh -uh. Sabretooth Series 9 to Sabretooth Series 10. They're, they're both drum spinner things. I don't know, like, Sabretooth is always in, because it's always so different every time they bring it back. Wait, see, that's the thing. If I was going to then follow this up with Series 8 to Series 9, which is still a drum, still yellow, but very different. Because to me, 9 to 10, absolutely fine. It looks like a... Re the Series 10 version looks like a refinement of the Series 9 one. So to me, I'm fine with that. Whereas a lot of their other transitions have been much bigger jumps in terms of design. It's almost like they, they've almost built a brand out of having a robot that never looks the same twice. <laughs> That's the thing as well. <laughs> it's like, at this point, it's kind of like Doctor Who. Mm. Or The Doctor, should I say. Yeah. Or James I am a Bond. good nerd. Yeah, that would be the more socially acceptable version of that example. <laughs> Is it more socially? I don't know. It's just, another, it's just another example. A different example. Wider audience. Fewer assumptions made about that audience, I'd say. <laughs> Possibly. So does Sabretooth get a pass purely on that basis? 
<sighs> that that's their niche. I mean, so th- sorry, that's their niche. Oh. <laughs> so this, this, this. I mean, this exposes the uh, my, my my true feeling about this, which you're not going to like because it's one of those diplomatic things where I don't really have a strong opinion, which is that people can name their robots however they want. <laughs> It's a personal thing. And um, we can judge them for it. That's how free speech works. <laughs> <laughs> um, versioning is hard. And I don't think that Sem... I mentioned earlier that I don't think Semver is the best the best thing to do. I've, I've, I've recently come across a, a different way of doing versioning, which I think is better. Would it work for combat robots? That's fine. I'm going to tell... I, I would explain to you the versioning system and then you can tell me if it works for robots. <laughs> The idea is it's basically it's two numbers. The first number is the year that you released it. And the second number is the number of like the, the, the nth release of the year. So the first the first release of the thing in the year of the software would be, for this year anyway, would be 2019.1. Then if I released a, a, a fix, no matter how big or small, doesn't matter what it is, that would be 2019.2. I would go with that for robots, but I would not increment by changes i would increment by public appearances i think that could genuinely work (laughs) so for us it's hello there 2019.1 or whatever for bugglebots version well no because that's not that's not that's not publicly happened yet (laughs) oh would it have to be by order that it's no no that would be insane yeah so 2019.1 in bugglebots 2019.2 in robo nerd and then 29 2019.3 in FRA champs. In the FRA champs, slash Euros, slash whatever the hell it's called. See, that would be truly agreeable. I think that is just truly agreeable. Just, except for the fact that you are fighting desperately to find a reason to argue with it. I'm thinking that I still wouldn't be happy, like, knowing... And the problem is I don't know if this is the case. I don't know if, say, Lifter Bite Force and Spinner Bite Force both still exist physically. And if they did that would still be a problem to me in that they would both then have 2019 versions that exist. But I suppose the first version only really comes into existence once it makes a public appearance to become Mm 2019.1. Or is there just a 2019 before it makes an appearance and then it becomes a 2019.1 upon appearing? It's a point... Well, so the the, the first release of the software in the year is the point one. And, well, I'm I'm sure some software developer somewhere start counting at zero and go I'm going to 2019.0 but like no 2019.1 is the first release because humans count from one don't tell me how to count I'll count from three if I want brilliant I genuinely like that as a system uh-huh. well. I think that is the most agreeable system so far if so let's say Sorry, <laughs> when you say public appearance, did all the robots that were on display a Robo Nerd increment their versions? <laughs> you see, immediately in my head, it was like they have to run at that appearance. And how, if you but have... I suppose that means that Onslaught got a new version. It got a 2019 version by running in the car park. <laughs> and what happens if you have, if we, if you had, like, because some teams obviously rebuild their robot and have the old one around still if you had them both there how do you deal with that do you just suddenly have two things that have got the same version or do you have one that's point one and one that's point two would it depend on which one you got out the car first (laughs) how does gemini increment oh no no (laughs) to be fair the two gemini robots do have separate names they just entered under the group name of gemini Mm. So yeah, that, that does create the potential issue of two robots with the same name still existing. What about teams that turn up to BattleBots with two copies of the robot? Like the Cophead team, for example. Yeah. I they just... put one out in one fight, the other one out in the next. So that's <laughs> Copperhead 2019.1 in one fight, Copperhead 2019.2 in another fight, and then back to point one in the next fight. <laughs> or is that then a new public or is, appearance? Or is it point three? <laughs> uh... You get this weird, like, stepping of the two robots forwards in number. I think you've got to disregard the physical... Uh, this is the... Because you're, you're, you're taking something that's digital and applying it to physical things. The because, robot is not an object, it is a concept. Well, exactly. Let's, let's, let's take things up a level. Let's get a bit philosophical. We consider the robot as a concept. And Copperhead was 2019.1. And I don't think you have to increment or could increment reasonably on every fight that they do. 
I think it's got to be their appearance in BattleBots 2019 is 0.1. Yeah, I would absolutely agree with that. And that's kind of what I ran with when I was going through Hello There as a sort of example as well. I think that's very fair. And we have solved the problem. So round of applause for us. Well, the other the other thing, though, is that most robots on televised things would be 0.1, surely. <laughs> well, no, because they might have done a live event or something before as a warm-up. Yeah, but like, how often do they compete in a live event with a different name? Uh, Monsoon recently was allowed to compete at a UK live event under the name Monsoon, Monsoon. but that was after the season. I think the issue is more that for something big like BattleBots, people build fresh. Yeah. Yeah, so like, I think you'd probably have some robots that are coming there as a 0.3 or 4 or something, but like... I'd imagine a lot of them would be a point one, and the ones that are only ever on Battle Boss would be 2019.1, 2020.1, 2021.1. That's, That's absolutely fine. Yeah, it's just funny. I think we've nailed it. Well, there we go. It's sorted. Everything is fine. <laughs> no one needs to worry anymore. They just have to think of fun, creative names for their robot that yeah. will still work with a lot of numbers after them. Yeah. I suppose we're done. You can find the show notes for this episode at spinapproof.com slash episode slash 60. And there you can find links to all the stuff we've been talking about today. You can also find a link to our Twitter at spinapproof, where you can tweet to us your favorite spaceship. So a little while ago, Tom Scott on YouTube uh, did a video about this company called Robo Race, And they have developed some some platforms, I guess, for autonomous driving, these these, these, these cars and they're running these race races for them so the, the the competitors come and supply a race driver in the form of some software package that they then install into the car and then they race the cars and it's a test of who has the best software this is something that i wanted to talk about mostly in the context of conversations we've had in the past about ai in robot combat and whether autonomous machines should kind of be the end goal of robot combat almost and whether that is something that we would find entertaining to watch and a wider audience would find entertaining to watch so for me this can be a really interesting test case of what it's like to take humans out of the equation in sport see i think this this has the potential for for me to find it interesting because i have some understanding of what it would take to write this software. What I was, what I can't find, right? So I don't know how much of the software they're supplying, like how much of the software the team is supplying to the car versus how much of it is, here's a car, it's got a huge amount of software already there. It exposes a tiny little API service, surface, and then you just, you, because he described it as like you supply a few thousand lines of code, which is not a lot of code. Like you're not, you're not writing a fully autonomous system in a few thousand lines. Like that's, that's relying on a, on a lot of other stuff that's been written by someone else. And that makes me really question how much influence the teams actually have over what the card does. <laughs> and, but like, I feel like if you know about the software, maybe it's entertaining. I don't know. The sense I get is that this is going to be entertaining to people who care about the programming, provided they're not that interested in motorsport already. Yeah. I don't think this is something that is going to appeal to motorsport fans in particular, because I was going to say they, but I suppose I can say we. I like a lot of formats of motorsport. I've fallen out of love with things like F1 recently, but that's because they've become boring. <laughs> I think fans of motorsport have a certain expectation that I don't think this will be able to meet. And I think one of the issues we've got here tonight is that we're probably thinking about this in very different ways. You're thinking about the tech side, I'm thinking about the entertainment side. Well, so so I am someone who has a sense of the tech the tech going into this and isn't all that interested in in motorsport. And so like by your description just then, I'm almost like the audience for this. And I think it's interesting to learn about, and it'll be interesting to watch a race. I'm not sure it carries any interest beyond that. And it's especially, and, and the thing is as well, that is that the, the less software the teams are writing, the less interesting it is. Because it's not a test of of them writing good. If you, it's if you're given a car and just raw sensor input, and like now you can write software, that like you can get wildly different things out of that. Like and all kinds of different approaches to how 
how that works and like some people could you know you could do like these machine learning algorithms you could do some that are just there is no machine learning it's all just algorithms hand tuned by humans uh you could have all kinds of different approaches for the how the code is structured and all that kind of stuff and that might be interesting to know it might not be but at the very least i think it would result in a wider range of outcomes whereas if it's just here's a car we've got we've written a whole bunch of software and on top of all that software we've we've, it, we've developed a platform with a small api and you can interface with it with, and you can interface with it with python it's like well that's less interesting because it's like well the, the people competing the, the competitors aren't doing very much they're just sort of connecting wires together almost like it's i don't know like and it's entirely possible that my trepidation here comes from the explanation that the guy on video gave which was presumably quite simplified for a broader audience i'd love to know more about what the development environment is what the api is but their website has no information about that so i don't know what language you write in i don't know the extent of the api i know nothing about it. all i know is that it runs on an nvidia platform and that's useless to me <laughs> all you know is who their partners are yeah basically. exactly um and so that's a bit sort of like uh, would that be interesting to watch i don't know and like without I mean, I don't know. I'm just not interested enough in motorsport. So, like, I don't know if I'd find anything else about it interesting. It's one of those things I think would be interesting to read about and look into and, like, research. And it'd be cool to sort of see the approaches that the teams take in terms of the software they write. But I don't think it's world's... I would probably put it, for me, and my lack of interest in motorsport as, like, on par with other motorsports. It's like, okay, it's cars going real fast. I guess it's slightly less interesting because there's no people involved. But, yeah. I think it would be interesting, and we don't really know much about how this is all set up in terms of teams, but if you've got, say, let's imagine this is like Formula One and you've got 10 teams running two cars each, say. I would love to track over the course of a season how each team develops and improves, or if they do. Because you've got a spec series here where all the cars are the same. So in that respect, it's really interesting to go, okay, who uses this resource best? You know, is there a team that starts off terrible and then partway through the season, they work out some new approach that suddenly takes them from the back of the grid to the front? That, I think, could be really interesting. But what I imagine you will get, well, you get one of two things. Either they're running time trials, in which case everyone just optimises their car to do a lap. And I'll tell you right now, no one's watching that. That used to be qualifying and then it was fun. No one's watching that as a whole series. If they're putting multiple cars on track, then what I envision happening is most races being decided by accidents and mistakes. So you will end up with a race to be as conservative as possible and just complete races without incidents, which for the future of autonomous cars is probably a really useful thing to be working on, but not entertaining. That's the more more the style of thought that I have on it, but that's because I don't understand the beh stuff behind it anyway. See, I don't think that I don't think that it would be a bunch of conservative cars. I th so I agree. I think there's like a couple of outcomes here, and I think one of them is just a distillation of everything I don't like about F1, which is that the entire thing is decided within the first second. Like it's just like, oh, who has the best start? <laughs> um, which I think is probably quite likely, assuming the cars make assuming the cars make no mistakes, but. Um, but I also think that there's less reason to be conservative because there's no one in the car. And so all you've got is a financial motivation to not screw up, right? Because like I presume you're on the hook for the cost of the car. And so like surely you'd, you'd want like the, the most aggressive AI, the most aggressive software is going to be the one that's, that wins. Because there's no, I can't, you know, that's what I'd do. <laughs> I'd be like, I'm just going to do the one that doesn't give up the line. Like if someone's coming in behind, it will hold the line. If it's trying to overtake, it will it will force the other car out of the way if it at all can. Like, yeah, I'd sort of, I'd, I'd think they'd be much more aggressive. It's one of those to finish first, first you must finish kind of situations. If everyone is crashing out around you, the best thing to do is not be one of them. You're not going to win any races, but you're not going to come last in them either. Yeah, but if everyone's being conservative, the best way to win is to be the aggressor. Oh, yeah, once that happens. <laughs> but I think you're going to start with people with wildly different approaches and it's just going to converge into that sort of status quo. Yeah, I think it will converge into a very boring thing where everyone's in the middle, not overly conservative, not overly aggressive, and it just becomes the worst bits of F1. It will. I, I fear it would become a procession. Yeah. But that's also based on my assumption that working out how to overtake is going to be one of the hardest things. 
But I'm basing that purely on, oh, that seems tricky. That's not based on any actual knowledge of how you program these things. Yeah, I don't know how you program it either, really. But like... It seems to me that making a car follow a good line seems like it would be the easy part of this. Because that is a question of taking the track, telling it what the line is, and it following it. That, as far as I'm aware, isn't a particularly big leap in autonomy. And obviously, they, these cars are doing things above that in terms of you know, adapting the way they drive to track conditions and things like that, which will be part of that and is good. But that seems like the part that is easy. That's like job number one. The leap to go from that to, okay, how do we efficiently deviate from this line in order to pass someone? That seems like a big step up in complexity. And to do so without hitting them. Although I suppose object avoidance is kind of easy in a sense. Yeah. I'm just trying to think about what would make this interesting to me. And I think it's got nothing to do with the cars. So humans like human stories. They like like feats of human achievement. And you, you definitely get feats of human achievement in software development. There are definitely there there are store there are there are legends in the world of software development and there are stories about about um about these breakthroughs and the people that did them. So like a few examples that sort of immediately spring to mind is uh, John Carmack, who's a video game developer, founded co-founded id software who made doom among other things these are some of the first and quake some of the first like 3d first person shooter video games and one of the big breakthroughs that that carmack had was a quick way of calculating square roots on a computer which was vitally important for geometry for doing this kind of 3d stuff you needed to be able to do because everything's triangles you needed to be able to do this do square roots of stuff and um and to do that quickly meant that they could get acceptable performance on really low end hardware and and that's cool and then the other sort of like areas of like amazing optimization come from um, again more video game stuff the way that i think it was crash bandicoot was originally packaged for the playstation they had a certain amount of space that they could use on disc to to ship the game and they couldn't they didn't have a deterministic compression algorithm for doing this it's like they could make it all because it had a bunch of requirements it has to fit on the disc but it also has to be organized on the disc in a way to efficiently put it off the disc into memory and there's not a lot of memory in a playstation so you got to sort of like balance all these things and the algorithm that they came up with in the end was non-deterministic and so because it just tried random things until it found an arrangement that happened to work and there was no guarantee it would ever find one and if you found one even with exactly the same input, there was no guarantee it would ever find another one. And so you sort of come, and so there's stories about how they sort of had to make a last minute change without screwing up all that packing stuff. And these sort of like really clever little optimizations at really low levels for how to do that. And I can imagine races being decided based on low level optimization. But again, I come back to the idea of how much control do the people have over the car? Because the these low level optimizations, these you know these really fast square root things, these sort of clever ways of sort of repacking stuff without breaking things and all that kind of stuff, it comes from having incredibly fine control over the hardware. It comes from like, oh, we've got a variable here that is an int, and that's the smallest unit of thing that we can do, and that's eight bits. But I've got two bits of four bit data, so I'm going to use one int and then have to split it and recombine it and stuff to make really efficient use of that memory. And you can't do that if you haven't got access to the really low level hardware and so it's sort of like i can i'm rambling i can see that there's interest in this in terms of these sort of like really amazing reframings and optimizations at quite a low level and the stories that you can get out of that of like the two or three people that came up with a, a new way to interpret this data to allow them to make some decision based on the lidar quicker than anyone else which allows them to find an extra like half a second in a corner or something like that i can see those things happening but only if they've got really low access to the low level access to the hardware and even then these things are only impressive if you have a sense of what it takes to do software development like that's not i imagine that those stories like you know finding a quick way to do a square root it's not interesting unless you unless you're into software development like for most people you don't care like computers are fast enough and always have been so it's sort of i struggle to see the wider appeal of this and i struggle to see the appeal of this for anyone who's not involved in it directly because even though i do know it and can make and derive some interest from like thinking about what they'd have to go through it's like well 
I still wouldn't watch it. I wouldn't read a huge amount about it, I don't think. It's like, if I were doing it, that'd be awesome. But beyond that, I don't know. I don't see it. And that, I suppose, is where it all comes back to the conversations we've had about this in Robot Combat of, it can be really clever, and you can talk about it in a really engaging way, but if it's not good to watch, then I won't say it has no value, because that's objectively not true. It has a certain amount of value in terms of developing useful technologies. But as something that they seem to be planning to market, it's really hard to see how that's going to take off. Yeah, I think sports like live and die on human stories and the stories of human achievement. And you, you, the things that like are really like the memorable moments in BattleBots or anything else like this is when someone does like someone like a really well timed hit or something like that. Like I think, or an unlikely escape from a pit, or an unlikely escape from a pit, or any or things like that that are just kind of like oh a person did that, a person made a decision based on incomplete information and managed to do it I was, you know and 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 you lose that with the with the machine doing it that's very much the angle that i've taken when we've spoken about this before with this specific case i think it could still work if the racing is good enough to make people start watching it because if people start watching it and you can then communicate those stories with them then I think you start to engage people, but the action has to be good first, and then the communication has to be good first as well. But I don't know it's how you second. I don't know how you communicate it. Like, let's say that a race comes down to a an improved algorithm for um, interpreting the data from the lidar that gets them that half a second in a corner, and that's what the race comes down to. You can have a commentator who says with some level of authority that's an impressive feat they found a way to do it you might even be able to find someone who can give an extremely high level overview of how it works but when it comes down to it the actual nitty-gritty of it is so far beyond anyone who hasn't spent years writing software that it's just not worth trying to get into like because you end up having like a foundational you end up having to 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 fully appreciate some of the stuff that people do in highly optimized software you need to understand a computer. You need to understand that it switches going on and off. You need to understand how the bus works and how the clock frequency affects everything. You need to understand the whole memory architecture and whether it's and like how the computer accesses memory. You need to understand what memory is, the difference between memory and storage. You need to understand a whole bunch about maths often. It comes down to understanding the difference between an int and float and like words that don't necessarily make sense. Or I don't know, like it's just I just think it's really hard to tell someone about successes in programming. I really struggle to tell people about the stuff that I've done that I think is impressive and it's not that impressive and not that difficult. But like even at the very high level that I work, it's just you just can't communicate it with someone who doesn't have a similar level of experience to you with software. I think the answer in terms of putting this to a general audience is that you don't try. And I think this is something that we see quite a lot in BattleBots. We, as people with a reasonable understanding of what's going on, often wish that we were being told more detail. Whereas in BattleBots, often you will get something, it's like, we changed to these lighter motors and that let us put some more armour on. And that is the kind of level of detail that people get. Yeah. And most of the audience seem to be happy with that. And I think there would be an equivalent of that in this. I don't know what that would look like, but I do think it would be, it would be kind of going, oh, you know, let's look at let's look at this footage of them on this track last year and them on this track this year and oh look they've got they've gained half a second on that corner. They've done that by doing this massive oversimplification of what they've done. Well yeah. I guess the the other thing that occurs to me right now is that like do you show software? Do you show the code on screen? Matrix style. Well not obviously not matrix style, but like early today I was watching a video of a guy about an hour long video and this guy's working on an integrated development environment for his homegrown operating system and it's just i'm just watching a guy program c++ i don't understand c++ i'm a java developer but like it's still interesting <laughs> and i understand enough of it to sort of like follow what's going on but like the same thing if he were just explaining it without showing the code i don't think would be nearly as interesting so it's sort of like if they're talking about advancements in algorithms you've got to show that on screen but then I'm immediately going, well, if they've got advancements in algorithms, because because humans are cynical and greedy, they're going to want to like get patents on that, or patents, or however you pronounce that word, on that stuff. Patent. Then, 
pretense on it and they're not going to want to to show the source code for that and like do you insist that all code is like gpl or something like i don't know i don't know it's weird i honestly wasn't imagining they would ever show a single line of code to average viewers you would show the impact of changes not the mechanics of changes yeah and as soon as you as soon as you don't show the mechanics it's lost interest for me like i don't it's like well it's just remote control cars <laughs> and i feel like big picture they're fine with that because they don't see you as the audience they want because there aren't enough of you no to make them viable i wish they had information on their website i'd love to know what the technology stack is it's in fury you go there and it's just marketing material and nothing else and with that i think i'm done so i've got a headache starting <laughs> listening to you no not at all but i think it's because i haven't really drunk anything all day turns out that's an error <laughs>